The HLX video is still in production, yet it needs quite a bit more time before it's fully released. Don't worry, this video has nothing to do with that, but there's probably a little tidbit of information hidden in here somewhere. QuakeCon has recently ended, and I've spent some of my work time in the last week trying to dig a bit deeper into everything that has happened, because I had a feeling that there was a lot more going on than meets the eye, and I was right. This is a free update for anybody that has owned any previous version of Doom or Doom 2. If you had it at one point, odds are if you go to the store, you'll be able to upgrade. This is an enhanced source port using the Kex engine as a wrapper in the same way that it was used for Quake 1 and Quake 2. We have FPS interpolation all the way up to, well, I've tested it all the way up to 165 FPS. We have an FOV slider. We have many different options for the soundtrack. We'll talk about IDKFA in a bit, but we also got FM synth with two different synth patches. We got the original MIDI soundtrack available, but not the Roland SC55 as the base for that mini soundtrack. I've seen a couple of places report it as such. The Roland SC55 was kind of seen as the top of the line consumer MIDI device at the time that Doom was released. So many people consider that version of the MIDI soundtrack to be the definitive version. There is a mod already up on Doom World, however, that replaces the MIDI soundtrack with an accurate recording that was based on an SC55 emulator. Anybody that is trying to make a specialty difficulty such as pistol start, responding monsters, fast monsters, those options are built in game and are no longer launch options. Options. We have immediate quick save and quick load. The importance of what I'm about to discuss has to do with community-made WAD compatibility, allowing mods that were made over the last 30 years to be playable in this re-release. There have always been difficulties in trying to achieve that compatibility due to licensing different aspects of these engines. They were able to alleviate this issue through brute force work. That's why this is important. It is advertised everywhere that this source port supports up to boom levels of compatibility. Boom, in case you're unaware, was a source port written in the late 90s that added significant features to allow mappers to create much larger, more robust levels. And this is true. The Boom implementation here is actually clean room reverse engineering, as the original Boom is under a GPL license, which would require id Software and Night Dive to open source this entire project in order to utilize that standard. It's actually clean room based on the work of Ethan Watson, otherwise known as Gooberman. Gooberman was working on a source port of Doom based on chocolate Doom called Rum and Raisin Doom, which aimed to do exactly this, add a clean room to reverse engineered implementation of Boom. But it also attempted to clean room Marine's best friend. Marine's best friend, by the way, was the successor to Boom, adding even more features. There's a third standard called MBF21 that was added nearly 20 years later. This source port supports all three of those standards. The majority of the custom mods you can think of when you think of Doom mods work here. The things that the doesn't support are the Eternity Engine and GZ Doom. On top of Boom, MBF, and MBF21, this source port also adds something called the id24 standard, which adds even more toys for mappers to play with. Legacy of Rust, the new expansion that was added within this source port, takes full advantage of all of these features, and if you've played through it, you've likely noticed a lot of different things happening that were not possible in Vanilla Doom. This is why. There is detailed documentation on how to utilize the features of id24, however, if a mapper wanted to create a new mod utilizing the id24 standard, it requires the id24 resource wad that was packaged with this source port in order to run. That wad cannot be legally distributed outside of this port. The release comes with all official wads. Doom, Doom 2, TNT, Plutonia, the Master Levels, and even Sigil. But Sigil 2 is not added in here. Sigil 2 is a quote-unquote featured mod. According to Night Dive, it was an issue of timing. Quote, I'm not sure exactly what happened with Sigil 2, but it probably came out too late. Another interesting little tidbit here is that the master levels are played in a specific order. Up until this point, the master levels had to be played either as separate wads that had to be loaded individually, or, for example, on the 2019 Unity port of Doom, they were just picked on a menu. The background music and some of the skyboxes have also changed for the master levels. However, it is not known if that's a feature or a bug. The aforementioned Legacy of Rust is the new expansion. Two episodes, 17 maps in total, and some of the most technically impressive level design that I have seen coming out of a vanilla plus Doom engine. Of course, that has a lot to do with the new id24 standard. However, these are still very interesting levels. This whole expansion was created in collaboration with id Software, Night Dive, and Machine Games. Legacy of Rust incorporates a lot of alpha and beta content and concepts. For example, the first level created by Kaiser is very much Doom Bible inspired. For those unaware, Tom Hall, before the core development of Doom was to start, created the quote-unquote Doom Bible, a large text document that went into exactly 
exactly what he wanted to achieve during Doom's development. It was very different, and there have been a lot of mods that have attempted to recreate what the Doom Bible wanted to do. This level starts out in the Doom Marines military base. People are playing cards, people are living their lives, but obviously something has happened and all of the people are turning on the Doom guy. That's straight out of the Doom Bible. There are two new weapons, both of which are based off of assets that were found in the id archives, we'll get to that in a second, and new enemies, almost all of which are based off of cut concepts from previous enemies or earlier iterations of released enemies. The id vault has returned from the Quake 2 remaster, and this time it is significantly cooler. And up until this point, we have known that John Romero had access to significantly more than what he was allowed to release. For those that were unaware, John Romero started releasing some Doom assets that were cut through development and was told by Bethesda's lawyers to stop, leading many to believe that he just had this massive vault of content. Are there more unreleased assets that I can't show for Doom? I have tons of unreleased assets for Doom. <laughs> I only picked a few things um, when I released those many years ago, but yeah, I have tons of stuff that's not released. I can't release them because they told me not to. <laughs> well, now we have the massive vault of content. And in fact, what John had paled in comparison to what id Software had on a few backup archives that they were able to compare and contrast with. Very little of what was there hasn't been released. And for what you're just seeing in the id Vault menu is not even close to what's sitting here in the files. They just dumped it. Five different unused levels are just sitting in the files that can be played separately if you know how to load them up properly. There were plans to make all of this playable in a Quake 2 style id Vault, but they ran out of time and maybe they'll be able to do that at some point in the future. Andrew Halschultz, the guy who was responsible for many of the most popular boomer shooter renaissance soundtracks, partially got his start through a project called IDKFA, which attempted to take Bobby Prince's original MIDI soundtrack for Doom 1 and recreate it using all real instruments, aside from drums. Not only is IDKFA officially added within this port, but Andrew Halschultz went back and did the exact same thing for all of Doom 2's soundtrack. That is also included. Doom 1 Plus 2 also includes a mod browser, something that allows any user to upload their wads and share them with anybody else playing this game on all platforms except Nintendo Switch. This is cool with some issues. Number one, nothing is stopping people from uploading content that isn't theirs. Obviously, the Doom modding scene goes back over 30 years, so it's not going to be possible to have everything uploaded by the original authors. However, a lot of stuff is being uploaded right now that is very obviously not being uploaded by the people who created it. There are already conversations happening on the Doom world forms to try and figure out a solution to this system. According to Night Dive, the way to go about fixing it is to report the stolen assets. I personally believe that does not go far enough, and it also shines a light on some of the other issues with this mod browser. While I really appreciate an official implementation of modded content in the game on most platforms, the way in which you find that content is a mess. There is very little sorting, there is no text searching, meaning that you could be, for example, 10 pages in and you click on a mod and download it. When you back out of that mod download page, it sends you back to page one. Each of these pages do not load instantly. Sorting, searching, and general user experience needs to be improved on the mod browser. The other issue is there are many, many broken mods being uploaded to the platform. One of the very first things that people attempted to put up on this platform is My House a very GZ Doom mod. Now, this source port does not support GZ Doom. GZ Doom is effectively its own engine. So things like My House don't work. It is surprising that users are able to upload obviously broken and incompatible mods. Hopefully something comes in the near future to alleviate these concerns. Achievements were added. The first time we've seen achievements on the classic Doom games on Steam and something that I actually begged Hugo Martin to do years ago, even though the Chainsaw achievement is currently only working on Doom 2 because some dummy thought the chainsaw was a Doom 2 exclusive weapon. Multiplayer is also a core component of this port. Not only did Night Dive go back and add 16 player networking for both competitive and deathmatch, they contacted many legendary deathmatch mappers from the Doom community to either create or recreate some of their best work and shipped it all officially within this game in a 25 map deathmatch wad. Now as it currently stands, it is not possible to play any custom wads in multiplayer, even though the team wanted 
to do so. To quote Night Dive, quote, it's not so much planned as it's something that we want to address, but we'll see what time allows. It's a bit of a UI complication because the UI in multiplayer mode can't read into wads and thus cannot parse their maps. There's also no way to actually load the map into the UI, and we don't presently know what to do if a user doesn't have a mod. However, at least on PC, you can still load mods in multiplayer via a launch parameter. Your lobby will be hidden from others, who do not have the same mod. The team also reportedly tested out the Game Boy Advance exclusive deathmatch maps, which sucked, as those were designed for a much smaller player count and were very simplistic in order to run on Game Boy Advance hardware. Also, you can't sort the servers. Trying to find a game is kind of a mess because you can't sort anything by ping, player number, whether or not a server is full, whether or not you want to play cooperative or deathmatch, whether or not you want to play on the new deathmatch maps or classic deathmatch maps from the campaign, there is no sorting. Doom on the Super Nintendo was programmed by Randy Linden, the same guy who's responsible for Dragon's Lair on the Amiga, the PlayStation emulator Bleem, that one unreleased port of Quake to the Game Boy Advance. The Super Nintendo port of Doom is actually running on a proprietary engine, because the Doom engine was not going to run on 16-bit hardware, and due to that, there were obvious limitations in the gameplay. Levels had to be cut down, not all the levels were there. It wasn't a great port, but given the hardware, it was the best that you could possibly do. Until now. Limited Run Games has part partnered with Randy Linden in order to update Doom for the Super Nintendo for some reason. There are two known editions, pricing of which is unknown. The Ultimate Edition is limited to 666 units, and it is known, according to Randy Linden himself, I personally asked, that this Doom ROM for the Super Nintendo will not be sold outside of these physical editions. So if you want it, you have to buy the cartridge. This cartridge is running a Super FX3 chip, according to Josh Fairhurst, the owner and president of Limited Run Games. Quote, this new version of Doom runs off the Super FX iteration Super FX3, which is how it's capable of running things like full motion video. When I first booted the game and the Bethesda splash screen played, my mind was blown. The Super Nintendo was not capable of this. Full motion video was already achieved, however, on the Super Nintendo using the previously unreleased MSU1 expansion chip, so it's actually unknown if he means a third iteration of Argonaut's own Super FX chip, or if they're calling MSU1 or an iteration of MSU1 Super FX3, it's unknown. This version of the game is a full implementation of Ultimate Doom, with all four episodes. It's apparently still running on Randy's original engine, but all four episodes are here, meaning technically 14 levels are being added from the previous Super Nintendo version, and a lot of the levels that had to be cut down in order to fit on the cartridge and run at a decent frame rate have been expanded, at least some. This game also supports circle strafing, respawning monsters, nightmare difficulty, a music player or jukebox function because the Super Nintendo music is actually highly regarded, and rumble controller support. Not only did they create a whole new coprocessor for the Super Nintendo, they created a new controller methodology that allows for rumble feature to exist on the Super Nintendo. It's through a custom Super Nintendo controller being built and sold by Retrobit, and the rumble implementation is apparently open source. Sourced. All in all, Doom for the Super Nintendo is weird. I didn't expect to see this, but it's interesting. SteamDB has picked up information on a possible new branch to Doom Eternal that allowed for modding. During QuakeCon, we finally have information on what that is. It's called the id Studio Modding Tools. Id Studio is the exact same tools that id has used to create Doom Eternal and are using to create Doom the Dark Ages. This professional level tool suite release also comes with nearly the entire Doom Eternal asset repository categorized per level, allowing for the download size to be as limited as you need it. Downloading all of the assets in this release is over 500 gigabytes. It should also be stated though, the majority of the Ancient Gods Part 1 and 2 are not part of these asset releases. The Horde Mode maps are a part of this, which means that Reclaimed Earth and the Holt are here, but everything else is not. Hopefully, the DLC assets Assets can also be released alongside this. This was the passion project of Robert Duffy, the former technical director at id Software who has very recently retired his position from id after many decades of working at the company. Before retiring, Mr. Duffy made it a mission to revitalize the modding community inspired by the many community members creating Doom Eternal mods without any help, documentation, or tools from id Software. id Software's own tools were refined and polished for a public-facing release and were given out to some of the major Doom Eternal 
internal modders to create and port their previous work into this official ecosystem. They've even included tools to allow for the importing of old Doom Eternal mods into id Studio. There were mods already up for download because these mod developers had been working with these tools for months. Up until now, many different obstacles to creating new content have been overcome. The ability to use DLC entities in the main campaign, the ability to change up entities and load custom models, all of that has been solved. The biggest hurdle, however, is creating original geometry. Effectively, no one could figure out how to make wholly original levels on their own. Now that we have id Studio, it is very possible. And there are already original levels, albeit very gray boxed, early, rough levels, up for download. So even if you're not a person that wants to download hundreds of gigabytes of assets and tools and learn how to make mods, as long as you update to the Doom Eternal open beta, you will have access to anything that has been uploaded to the Doom Eternal modding platform. You can just play the mods because they're easily and openly distributed through Doom Eternal itself on PC. The modded playthrough actually takes place in a sandbox, external from your base Doom Eternal installation. Meaning if you have a bunch of saved games across the board, they will not be touched as anytime you install mods, you're effectively playing a second version of the game. That's fantastic because it's been a problem for playing modded Doom Eternal for the longest time that it would break your main game. There are some problems. For example, I have to log in with my Bethesda.net credentials every single time I want to look at the mod library. It does not remember my account information ever. Most of the models don't actually allow me to look at them within the tool set. They all claim that they don't have a skeleton, which makes it very difficult to open Open the majority of the animated models. I don't know why it keeps showing me this, but it keeps showing me this for more than 75% of the models in the asset repository. And also, even though I have every single thing downloaded and installed, the game reports a lot of missing assets. So I don't know if this is some kind of path error or if not everything was released. But if somebody from id that has something to do with these tools sees this video, I don't know why this is happening. I've even read up on the massive documentation. Id Software themselves wrote up an insane amount of documentation. This is instructions for users to learn how their tools work. And the documentation is meant to expand as the users give them feedback. Although this was the result of a passion project from a long time developer at id, id Software software identifies that this is an excellent avenue to getting into the industry, especially if you want to work at id themselves. We're excited about the opportunity that this is going to give people. One of the main inspiring factors in this has been the stuff that people were doing without any tools or any support whatsoever already. I mean, we'd look at it and be like, how? Again, it's it's on the dev side, you get very focused and you're just like, oh my God, this is insane. You don't just like see a few mods and be like, well, let's spend a year making all these tools available. It's a bigger right. initiative than that. But it really was inspiring to see what people were doing without the tools. It's the combination of hacking and modding what they were doing before. And, and now hopefully they can kind of just shift their mentality to just modding, using tools that can get people jobs in the industry. We get asked all the time, how do I get a job in the industry? And most of the time, the answer is you just have to make games. For the most part, people who've come to us have not had the experience of using our tools. So this is really an opportunity for people to get out there and use the exact same tools we use to make Doom Eternal and make cool game content. And if you want to get in the games industry, that is how you do it. And then have all those lessons in your head. So when you go in your interview, you know, you can tell whoever the hiring manager is, I did this, I did, I learned this, this failed, nobody played this. So I did this and that worked. That's how you get a job. This is their tool set. Which means if you are skilled at building content within this platform, you have a leg up on other people when interviewing because that means there's less time to train you. You already know their workflow. All right, the big one, Doom the Dark Ages, the next big Doom game, the next big id Software game. You've probably heard this, but in case you haven't, after the initial welcome broadcast at QuakeCon, the cameras were shut off and Marty and Hugo addressed specifically the attendees of QuakeCon to show them never before seen footage of Doom the Dark Ages. Are we good? All Don't right. tell anybody. It's just us now. There are no plans to release the footage that they showed at this show. We have to rely on a few audience members that were able to remember some of what they saw and reported back secondhand on the internet. So everything you're about to hear is secondhand information through reports on Doom World and on YouTube videos. So what was shown? The design of the levels are stated to be more open than previous modern Doom entries. 
not open world, but more exploration within loose linear maps. Unlike Doom Eternal, which Hugo has described in the past as a sports car, the Dark Ages is more like a monster truck. The Doom guy feels like a tank, a massive, powerful being but moving slower than Doom Eternal. Jumping, parkour, and movement has been slightly de-emphasized from the absolute chaos that was Doom Eternal. Jumping in particular was actually described as similar to jumping in modern Fallout power armor by multiple people. Okay, to put it simply, the developers of modern Doom have described Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal as never stop moving, push forward combat. Doom the Dark Ages is described as stand and fight. Weaponry. First of all are the punches. Unlike Doom Eternal, your punches actually do damage. You have punches, kicks, and a whole bunch of player-controlled physical actions that have nothing to do with melee. Physically assaulting enemies is now a viable option, especially now that the glory kill system has been completely overhauled. It is no longer canned animations that play upon clicking on a demon that is staggered. Instead, when a demon is placed in a staggered state, a purple halo will appear above the enemy's head, and the doom guy can then glory kill them through active player melee input, meaning the punch Punches and kicks are performed by pushing the buttons to do so to then perform the staggered glory kill. Punches are also stated to cause area of effect lightning attack that chains past enemies under certain circumstances. The shield saw is a multi-purpose weapon, allowing you to bash, punch, and throw. Throwing at an enemy can sometimes lodge the shield saw into that enemy causing them to continuously take damage until death or until the Doom Guy removes the saw. The shield can be thrown and stay where it was thrown, acting as a platform for traversal. And the shield itself can also cause an area of effect attack when thrown in certain situations. Concept art of a mace was shown with no mechanics described, and the flail was also shown off. The flail seems to be the game's true chainsaw, as when enemies are killed with the flail, it returns ammo. As for guns, three were discussed. The double-barreled plasma gun definitely went a little viral after Dave Osh retweeted about it. Unlike how most people are interpreting it as a super shotgun plasma rifle thing, it's more like the Quake nail gun in that it has two barrels that fire simultaneously. The Skull Grinder, which was shown off in the trailer, was reportedly shown off here. It's a machine gun of sorts that fires the ground up skulls of enemies. And a ballista weapon was also mentioned in passing. We don't know if it's called the ballista. What we do know is that there's a bolt gun of sorts that allow enemies to be pinned to surfaces with specific large bolt projectiles. Physics plays a much larger role in player and enemy interaction than before. For. for example, Destructible Demons is far more detailed. Reportedly, limbs, skins, and chunks all dynamically can be removed from the enemy mesh, and the deformation is physically based, which means depending on how and where you attack the enemy is how that enemy's model will deform. And that deformation is hard-coded into the animation system as it can sometimes play physically based can animations of limbs being ripped off and the enemies reacting to it, or at least that was the example given in this second-hand information. Demons across the board appear larger than their previous counterparts. For example, the Hell Knight was stated to be way more armored and much taller. The Mancubus was stated to be just massive. Shield soldiers apparently signal their attacks and blocks through the color of their shield. We've heard of two new demon types. One was described as a demon torso on arachnatron legs, and the other was described as a floating arachnatron brain. You would be fighting the arachnatron brain, by the way, during one of the game's main set pieces, the rideable dragon. For anybody that played the Ancient Gods Part 2, the Doom guy has a dragon. That dragon can be piloted in-game, and apparently is tied into a specific boss fight made for this dragon. However, the dragon can attack through fireballs. You saw it in the trailer. You also saw the Atlan mech. The mech that was sitting in the Fortress of Doom, taunting players through all of Doom Eternal, seems to finally be piloted. The mech has its own weapons, and actually can do its own glory kills. The mech itself is made to fight sentinel giants. 
Those things that you would pull the Sentinel batteries out of, the thing that you pulled the Crucible out of in Doom Eternal, those things you're fighting in a mech. And apparently, both of these things, the Atlan mech and the Dragon, are not one-time only events. They play a larger part in the entire game. Doom the Dark Ages is trying to channel classic Doom far more than any previous Doom. Jumping seems to be de-emphasized, parkour doesn't seem to be that big of a deal, but instead you're running around these environments with very powerful weapons fighting very powerful enemies where all of your actions are player controlled. This goes so far as the HUD itself is more centered, with a ghostly face reportedly being seen in the bottom middle of the screen. To quote Hugo Martin, the goal is not new but still doom, but new but more doom and more than ever. Hugo was quoted in saying that this is the best doom game they've ever made. And I'd also like to give a particular shout out to Levaniel, who was an attendee at QuakeCon, who took the time to be able to not only report on everything that they had seen during the presentation, but ask questions to the developers during different meet and greets throughout QuakeCon, and then report on that information on their own YouTube channel with two different videos. I highly recommend watching those if you want more detailed first-hand accounts on those that have seen this show. Link to Levaniel's channel down in the description below. And so this was all of the information I was able to find on this year's QuakeCon. And once again, the big Half-Life 3 video is still very much in production. Currently, we are trying to figure out ways of showcasing some of the mechanics visually using the Source Engine, and that's taking a while. But to leave you with just a tiny little sliver of information, gravity plays a big part in Half-Life. I'm Tyler McVicker, The Passionate Gamer. Thank you so much for watching, and I will catch you on the next one. If you want to support videos like this, get your name in the credits and get to see them early sometimes. Check out my Patreon and Floatplane pages, also down in the description below. Or if you just want to hang out, see, talk about different things that are going on in these videos, my Discord server invite link is down in the description below. I'd love to see you there. And of course, my Twitter profile is also down there. I'm Tyler McVicker, The Passionate Gamer. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Have a great day. Adios.